Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Angie, and I'm an alcoholic. My home group is the Thursday Night Del High One group. We meet in Cincinnati, Ohio, every Thursday at 8 o'clock. If you're ever in town, we always keep seats open. Please come and join us. Uh, I'm a little overwhelmed, uh, actually, uh, at just this whole thing. And I hope that the day never comes where this is just something to do for me. I'm overwhelmed at the amount of love that the people that I've met through my travels. I'm just extremely thankful that uh, the God of my understanding has blessed me with the gift of friendship and, and love and all the things that I thought I'd lost when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I gained here. As I come here and, and I see all of you and you guys hug me and you tell me, you know, how glad you are to see me. That's not been the case always. When I came here, people weren't happy to see me anymore. But you guys said you were happy to see me. And I appreciate that. I'd like to thank the committee for asking me to come here. Um, my big brother Lee and my brother John and, you know, uh, Lee's like my agent. You know, <laughs> you know he, uh, he, he does the deal and uh, I'm just extremely grateful. And the speakers have been phenomenal so far. Uh, been phenomenal. And Candace, of course, who I just absolutely adore. And, uh, you know, as I watched her, as I do with each speaker, just in absolute amazement that from whence we came, that we get a gift to be able to come and share our experience, strength, and hope at this level. It's a blessing. I'm going to share a little bit about uh, what it was like for me, what happened, and what it's like today. And I always like to let people know that I am originally from Greenville, South Carolina. And back home, we lived in a little white house on a red clay road. We got our water out of wells. We took baths in big steel tubs. We had an outhouse, which I was locked in quite often. (laughs) We picked blackberries for fun, and I didn't even wear shoes until I came to the city. I had flaming red hair and freckles, and nobody else in my family did. And my brother told me as he had me locked in the outhouse one day, he said, I know why you look the way you do. He said, because the mailman is your daddy. (laughs) So whenever I would see the mailman, I would go, Daddy! Oh, there go my daddy right there. Give me a hug. And uh, (laughs) and, uh, he would uh, put his arms around me and tell me how cute I was and pat me on the head and thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous in the book and the steps and sponsorship. I found out that that turned out to be a little pattern for me, actually. (laughs) That if you just put your arms around me and told me how cute I was, we were were basically married at that point. uh, You know, and six months down the road, I'm going, what is your last name again? You know what I mean? And uh, so I, uh, you know, I'm from a family of Baptist ministers, and uh, uh, my father got a job transfer, and we moved to uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. And in the process of my father traveling back and forth, he found himself a little girlfriend, and he started dating her, but he still moved us up, my brother, my sister, and myself, and my mother. And he moved us up to this little town called Lachlan, and he went to live with this woman, and uh, we stayed with my mother. And I need to tell you, when I spoke in Miami uh, a few months ago, I saw my brother for the first time in 30 years from that mere resentment that my father took on a family that had a son and had two daughters and he took care of them. I'm so thankful that I have the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and that freedom we get from resentment because that mere resentment is killing my brother. It's killing him. And when I met with my brother, he was one of the most angriest people I ever met. And he came and picked me up at the hotel and we went back to his house and he was just mad. And he stood there and he just drank beer after beer. 
And the more he drank, the angrier he got. And he said, what you doing down here with all these white folks? I was like, um. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know what to say, like, you know. <laughs> I mean, I thought he'd be mad if I said I was an AA. You know what I mean? So I was just like um, visiting my friends. And uh, he said, well, why are they all so white? And I'm like, I, I, that's something I think I'm powerless over, I think. And, uh, and he just got madder. And finally I looked at him and I said, I need to go back to the hotel. And now he's intoxicated. So he's driving at a high rate of speed. And he's drunk. And when I got to that hotel, Cindy and her partner were there. And I hugged them, and I was so glad to see you guys. And I was so thankful for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And maybe one day he'll find his way in here, and maybe not. But I know that I had to get back to you. And I had to leave him alone. And I did what I wanted to do. I was able to clean off my side of the street with my brother and come back to you here at Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm grateful that I got, was able to do that immense. So we moved to this little town called uh, Lachlan. And, and my mother had cleaned bathrooms for a living. And she made a, a solemn vow that her kids would never have to do that kind of work. And, Thank you, because I was headed towards electrocution. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Garrett. And uh, so in my household, we couldn't use the word ain't. We had to talk proper English. Uh, it was very important. Education was very important to my mother. And so my mother decided when we came to Cincinnati, Ohio, that we would go to Catholic schools. Now, you'll hear me talk about my mother a lot because when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I assassinated her character daily. Thank God for the book and the steps that I was able to see that the way that things happened when I was growing up and the way that they really were were two totally different things because this is a disease of perception. Man, and I just bad my mother. Well, as we speak, my mother has mental illness. She doesn't believe in taking medication. And it's a hard thing to watch. But I'm thankful that when I'm missing what I knew her to be, that I can come to Florida and I can walk up to Benoit and she'll put her arms around me as a mother would. See, I get everything I need in the hand, you guys. Even when I'm missing that. I get everything out of here. And so I badmouthed my mother. My mother worked as a waitress, and she sent my brother and sister and myself to private schools. That's how hard she worked. But when I got to AA, I told you that she was never around. And what I found out in Alcoholics Anonymous is that love is an action word. And that if I look at my mother's actions, she did just right by me. She worked to see that we had the best things in life. So now here I am with the nuns. I got a flaming red afro. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now you're overdoing it, Garrett. Now. I'll just wipe with both of them. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I had a flaming red afro and... Oh, gosh, freckles on my face. I didn't even know black people were allowed to have red hair and freckles. You know what I mean? And, 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 I, and I got on this white blouse and this plaid skirt and black and white spaltons and bobby socks. And I just got beat up on a regular basis. You know what I mean? Because it just didn't look normal. I looked at me every day. I had never, and all the people that I had come across in my little short life at that time, had ever seen anybody look like me. And I just knew that there was something different about me. My brother and sister didn't look the way I did. My mother didn't look the way I did. My father didn't look the way. I just knew that there was something different about me. So I'm at this little Catholic school, and my mother told me, you know, when we started Catholic school, she said, when they line up, 
to go get that little white cookie. Don't you take one. And so, you know, me being the kind of child that I was, as soon as they lined up, I did too. <laughs> and I went up there and I did that, what my mother asked me not to do. And that was the story of my life. Whatever you asked me to do, I did the opposite. It was just something that happened automatically. So there was this girl named Squeaky <laughs> in this Catholic school. Squeaky was like 6'10 in the fifth grade. <laughs> And uh, one day they stoned me on the way home from school. And I ran in the house and I told my mother, I said, whew, I'm glad I made it in the house. They was about to kill me. And when, whenever my mother sounded like this, I knew she meant business. She said, you know, Angela, at some point you're going to have to learn how to take care of yourself. And what I'm going to ask you to do, Angela, is to go back out there and you stand up to Squeaky. I said, you want me to do what? She said, you go out there and you stand up to Squeaky or you stay in here and get the butt woman and I'm going to give you. And I knew what my mother's felt like, and I only knew what Squeaky's appeared to be. <laughs> and I went out in that parking lot, and I stood up to Squeaky, and I said, my mother said I'm supposed to fight you. And she said, well, come on in. So I drew my fist up. <laughs> and I closed my eyes tight as I could. <laughs> and I knew she was tall, so I knew I had to reach up. <laughs> And I watched my brother get in fights, so he would put one foot back, and then he would bounce. <laughs> so I counted to three. I said, one, two, I couldn't believe it. It just happened. I got it right here. It, it was like the happiest day of my life, man. It was the happiest day of my life. I had hit the giant. And now I must tell you, because of the honesty of this program, that Squeaky didn't budge when I hit her. And she was looking at me, and she I said, you getting ready to kill me, ain't you? And she gave me the big beat down. But I got this thing called alcoholism that helps me remember what I should forget and forget what I should remember. And what I forgot was that she almost killed me. What I remembered was <laughs> And so from that point on, I became a boxer. I fought every opportunity I got. When I got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous in Cincinnati, I would tell them all, hey, <laughs> you better ask somebody about me. <laughs> you better check my track record. I have hurt people. <laughs> then, you know, you get those sponsors, uh, the real ones, who say things like, Ew, I'm scared. You know what I mean? And uh, so, you know, and then you get sober a little and you have to, you know, get honest. And, and the reason why, you know, they called me the knockout queen downtown Cincinnati. And it was because every time, you know, somebody hit me, they knocked me clean out. You know? <laughs> and, 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 you know, so, I, I mean, I, I, I've never won a fight. I didn't even win the fight, the one I had in AA. I just can't fight. That's the bottom line. That's why the police are my friend today. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, I'm at this Catholic school, and I'm going through the deal, and my mother comes and, and, and picks me up. And uh, by this time, my mother had got a job for a company called Avon, and uh, she was doing pretty well. And she came and picked me up from school, and she took me to our house. Because when we moved to Cincinnati, we lived in the projects. And she took me to our house, and... Uh, we pulled in, man, and it was a beautiful red brick ranch house, beautiful house, and long driveway, and, you know, everything I think my mother dreamed of, she was able to get that for us, and it was in an all-white neighborhood, and so we moved into this all-white neighborhood. We were the first African-American family to move in here, and uh, so from the age of 13 to probably about 20, I wasn't even black no more. I, uh, <laughs> I listened to Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band, and... <laughs> My favorite girl group was Heart. And the first concert I ever went to was Led Zeppelin, 1979. Yeah, yeah, but I have to tell you guys this. I was at the Ted Nugent Foreigner concert, right? Foreigner was singing Feels Like the First Time. You know, and they were doing Feels Like the First. I looked around that Coliseum. I didn't see one black people. I was like, it feels like I am bad. 
if you were going around that time, you know we had our air guitars, right? We, we played the heck out of our air guitars. And, uh, and, 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 and so I'm a legend. Now I'm a legend in my own mind. Because I'm the only black person in America going to rock and roll concerts. You see, so I'm hanging out and, and I'm getting this experience and I'm no longer black. And, and oh my God, I hang out with these five girls. And man, I loved, I loved these girls. We hung out, they taught me things that I didn't even know existed. But I hung out with these five white girls. My friend Rebecca, one day we were down in her, in her basement and her mother, her brothers were drinking down there. And her mother calls down for a family meeting. I had never heard of that before. And she yells down the steps, Rebecca? That's my white woman voice. Rebecca? <laughs> and she says to her children, Rebecca, your father and I have been communicating. <laughs> we understand that there's been some alcohol consumption, Rebecca. And your father and I feel, Rebecca, that if you're going to drink, we would appreciate it if you would do it at home. I said, what your mother just say? <laughs> She goes, oh, yeah, she wants us to drink at home. It's safer. I said, that's the closest family I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> man, it brought tears to my eyes, man. <laughs> that their parents were willing to let them drink at home for safety. I remember I went home to my mother and said, can I have a beer? <laughs> and, she, and she goes, no, sweetheart, not in this lifetime. And, and that's just the difference. That's just the difference. And... Uh, so I start hanging out with my friend Rebecca, and one night uh, Rebecca comes over to my house, and we're sitting at the end of my yard, way in the back, and uh, she comes, and she's got a brown bag, and uh, she gives me a bottle, and she has a bottle, and it's Boone's Farm Apple Wine. Oh, for God's sake, let it go. Get sober. And, uh, and so, you know, I'm going to tell you something. I talk in my church on a regular basis, right? When I mention Boone's Farm Apple Wine, they don't have that reaction. They don't react like that. They feel pity for me when I tell them that I drank that. But only at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous do I say that, and everybody's like, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Isn't it great? <laughs> Boone's Farm Apple Wine, ain't an apple been near it. You know what I mean? And we call it wine. It's amazing. And, uh... So she, you know, tells me that her brother had schooled her in the art of chugging and that uh, you turn the bottle up and you drink it as long and as hard as you can. And that's exactly what I did. And I turned that bottle up and I drank as long and as hard as I could. And I swallowed then and, and I, I waited a few minutes. And I'm going to tell you what. This is my story. It's what happened to me. Something happened at the bottom of my feet that rose slowly. It was heat, it was love, it was, I have based relationships on the way the alcohol made me feel that first time. If you could make me feel like that, we were good to go. We were good to go. I based it on that. Because see, that's when the love story began for me. That's when the love story began. And by the time that feeling rose to the top of my head, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that that was something I was going to do on a regular basis. On a regular basis. And that started my dance with alcohol. So I'm hanging out with my friends and I'm drinking on a regular basis. Man, and I'll tell you what, I'm having a good time. I'm having a good time. I'm going to rock and roll bars. You know what I mean? They, the band would bust out and they would play Brown Sugar by the Rolling Stones and I knew without a shadow of a doubt that it was written for me. <laughs> and I danced on that floor and it was feelings of wonderment and it was magical. It was magical. And that dance almost killed me. That love affair that I had with alcohol almost killed me. So I'm hanging out, and, and my dad had ended up getting me a job at a recording studio. I've been singing since I was a young girl, and, and I don't know, if you're an artist like I am, you kind of wait for the day when somebody just is going to discover you. You could be just eating dinner, and they just look at you and go, do you sing? <laughs> that is discovery to me. I don't have to be doing it. Nothing. They'll just look at me and go, do you sing? 
my name's Bob from Epic Records. You know what I mean? That's how I saw it in my head. So I'm in the bathroom at this recording studio. I hit my best Whitney Houston note. And And all of a sudden, I come out of the bathroom and there was a tall brother standing there. He said, was that you singing? I said, why? Why, yes, it was. And he said, I can make you famous. Really? He said, you just have to come to Las Vegas with me. No problem. <laughs> you guys are so funny. Oh, my God. <laughs> Las Vegas? And, uh, and uh, so I, uh, I tell him, no problem. I just need to go home and settle things up with my family. And so I go home and I call a family meeting and <laughs> it doesn't go quite the way Rebecca's did. <laughs> you know, my brother and sister are coming up begrudgingly. My father, we call him over and he going, what the? So I sit them all down and I said, I will be back for you. As soon as I get my first Grammy, I shall return. And my father, he kept things real simple. He would just look at me and go, something is wrong with you. <laughs> and my mother's going, Angie, please don't go. And my little sister's going, Angie, don't go. But I had to go because he said those, those words. I can make you famous, not me, but he could. And I'm telling you, I'm with you. If you can do it all, I'm with you 100%. <laughs> so I go out to Las Vegas and I'm a young girl singing and I'm opening up for some of the biggest people and I'm having the time of my life. There was no shame in my game. I remember one time they said, would you open up for this gentleman? And he sang that song that goes, trailer for sale. Why not? Why not? Because I'm about to get famous. And I'm out there and I'm drinking alcohol. Alcohol's flowing freely and I'm drinking freely and I'm having the time of my life. And then things started happening, and it may not happen here in Florida, but I would start to not remember stuff. <laughs> and I would begin to wake up next to people, and both of us looking at each other going, dang, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, and he's got one tooth and it's gold, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he's going, but you told me you loved me last night. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, Zeb, I... I probably did, and, uh, you know, and, and I apologize for that, Zeb, but I, I don't think so. So I'm out here, and I'm, now I'm starting to black out, and this gentleman had his own problems and uh, had his own affliction, if you will, and uh, he's doing his thing, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an alcoholic of more. I don't ask questions about what things are. I just say, can I have some? And that's what I did. And now I'm drinking alcohol doing enhancement intravenously and spiraling down at a rate of speed that today when I look back it's just absolutely scary. So now I'm doing this, I got this blackout thing going on. It wasn't until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous that they told me that the first drink was the problem. Never heard that prior to coming here. People would tell me like, Angie, don't drink whiskey. Just drink beer. Drink beer. It may be a little wine, but you guys were the one that told me that the first drink was the problem. So we're drinking and we're spiraling down and I'm losing singing jobs and I'm starting to get blacklisted and I'm starting to not be able to get a job in Las Vegas because when I drink, something happens to me on stage. It's like the alcohol hits me and my shirt just flies off, you know, and I'm standing in the middle of the stage just drunk going, feelings <laughs> nothing more than feelings you know what I mean and so I you know I'm an alcoholic and I understand that today and they didn't like that so I'm drinking now I'm getting blacklisted I'm dealing with this guy he becomes abusive we end up homeless living in a little seedy stinky roach field this was not the plan that I had for myself when I left with this man. You were going to know who I was because he told me he could make me important. He could make me famous. And the plan was going all wrong. And one day he comes and gets me. 
in this little dumpy car we had. And he says, I need you to drive me to the store. And when I drove him to the store, he went in and he shot and he killed the owner and he robbed the place. And when he came back out and he had the blood on, let me say something to newcomers in here. Let me share something with you real quick. That story right there kept me sick for a long time. I was afraid that if I told you that about me, that you wouldn't like me. If you're new in the room and you got a secret that's killing, you get a sponsor. A sponsor that has working knowledge of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and you free yourself. Because I stayed sick for a long time. So this gentleman is still in prison as we speak today. And here I am in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. At the Florida State Convention. I got a floater from the governor which says, just the way that I saw it, it said, don't you come back here no more. And I left Las Vegas vowing to never go back. I don't even watch stuff on TV about Las Vegas. <laughs> I'm scared they're watching me that way. <laughs> so I go back to Cincinnati, and I say to myself, that's it. That's it. I'm not going to drink no more. And I meant that from the bottom of my heart. Little did I know that I was powerless over alcohol and that it dictated and managed what I did. And I remember sitting and telling my family, that's it, I'm not going to do it no more. That's it. And I meant it. That's one of the reasons why when people drink again, I don't give them a hard time. Because every time that I said I was going to stop, I meant it from the bottom of my heart. I just didn't know that I had alcoholism. And that left to my own devices, I can't stop. So, a long time ago in Cincinnati, you could get on the Sunday bus. It was called Sunday Pass Ride. And my brother and sister and I were on the bus one Sunday and we rolled all over the city. And we got to the corner of Liberty and Vine in Cincinnati and there was a restaurant over to the left when we got there. And I looked over there and I'll tell you what. It was Lincolns and Cadillacs and, and pimps. And I remember my little sister looked over there and she said, boy, you couldn't pay me to go over there. And my brother said, shoot, me neither. And I remember sitting there thinking, I'm going over there tomorrow. <laughs> because I wanted to know what was going on. <laughs> and I started riding that number 20 bus, downtown Cincinnati, hanging out. Man, and it was just fabulous. It was awesome. And I'm sitting in these bars and I'm drinking and I'm watching these gangsters and, and I'm, I'm just caught up in the mix. I had three friends. Their names was No Neck, Greasy Feet, and Tie Dye. My friends. Man, I thought these guys were brilliant. They taught me how to go into a department store with a girdle on, roll up clothes, put them around there, close my coat and walk out of that store and go sell those clothes for the remarkably low price of I thought they were brilliant till I got arrested. And that changed the way that I felt about them. So now I'm going into stores, stealing people's stuff, drunk. That's not a pretty picture. I'm going in, stealing, and I'm getting arrested. I go and get a physical. I find out I'm pregnant. Having just got sentenced to a 7 to 25 to the Ohio Reformatory for Women. And I'm going to tell you something. The only reason why I didn't lose my mind, that prison bit, was because my child was growing on the inside of me. And I would rub my stomach, y'all, every day. And I would say, I'm going to be a good mother. I'm going to be a good mother. I'm going to stop this. When I get out, I'm going to be a good mother. And I meant that from the bottom of my heart. When I got my freedom, my son was four years old. All the way down 71 South, all I could think about was seeing my baby. All I could think about was just getting to him. And when I hit that, that Greyhound bus station, it's in the story Freedom from Bondage. That twist, that middle twist. Then it's in more about alcoholism. Suddenly the thought crossed my mind. In the book it says that he thought he could put a little whiskey in his milk. He sensed he wasn't being a bit too smart. And I went to that bar, and I ordered that drink, 
And the next time I saw my son, he was 10 years old. See, I don't know how powerful the disease is in your life, but I know how powerful it is in mine. As much as I wanted to get to my child, I could not get to my child. What was I going to tell my parents? It was baffling to me. Why is it that when I put alcohol in my system, I can't get to do what I need to do? I couldn't call my family and tell them that, so I did what any alcoholic would do. I just acted like it didn't exist. I acted like it didn't exist. And I went on about my business in a drunken stupor because for me to think was too painful. I'm going back and forth to jail. They give me probation. I'm committing crimes, but I'm not really committing them. I'm kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time. Because when I got sober, I would tell everybody I was a hustler, that I made a lot of money, that I was a gangster. And I remember I was on the phone in my father's house talking to somebody, telling them about what I did. And when I got off the phone, my father said, look here, Angie, why do you keep lying to these people telling them you was a hustler? And I was like, I was a hustler, Daddy. And he said, no, no, baby. A hustler don't get arrested every time they do something. <laughs> what you are, my dear, is a fool. <laughs> and I was like, okay, thank you, Daddy, for that boost of self-esteem. And uh... <laughs> so they give me probation. And this is just where alcoholism took me, in and out of jail. I come out long enough to get drunk. I stay drunk for a little while. I go to jail. Come back up. They give me probation this time. Guess what? I'm pregnant with my daughter. But I learned something different than my daughter and my son. See, I learned my daughter that I would just give her up for adoption. And I'm not saying this to brag. It's just where my alcoholism took me. I drank every single day of my pregnancy, never having a day of prenatal care. Every single day. I believe in angels, y'all. I was working at this restaurant. My stomach is getting bigger. This guy named Tom and his wife Elizabeth says, Angie, look, we're going to work, open up a restaurant in Bloomington, Indiana. Why don't you come with it? I said, okay, because I'm going to get my baby up for adoption. And I went with her. And this couple went in the delivery room with me when I had my daughter. And when you give a child up for adoption, they throw a black tarp over you so that you can't see the child. And they came and they got my baby, and when they took her out, I saw her hair. And I remember thinking to myself, I wish I could do something for her. But there's one who has all power. And I'm, they take her to the nursery and they take me to medical. And I'm laying in that room, and my parents found out where I was, and they said, Angie, bring her home. We'll take care of her. We'll take care. But what I thought y'all was that they were saying, they'll take care of us. And we ride all the way down to Cincinnati. And my daughter didn't make one sound. I said, God, please, I don't know what to do with this baby. She didn't make one sound. I looked her up several times just to see if she was breathing. And when we got to that Greyhound bus station, my parents were there. And they took that little girl out of my arms. And my daddy said, we got her now. And I said, what am I supposed to do? And they said, Angie, we don't know what you're supposed to do. But she didn't ask for this. And they got in that truck and they drove off with my baby. And I began to drink. And I began to drink and I began to drink. And one night I'm at the bar. By this time, I'm living on the banks of the Ohio River in a boarding house. One day I'm at the bar and somebody asked me if I wanted to go and do some enhancements and I said, okay. So I'm sitting with them and I'm drinking and doing this stuff and all of a sudden the guy took my drugs. He got high and he shot ice water into my vein. It was 17 blocks from where I was to that board house. And I'm just sick, y'all. And I'm walking and with every step I took, I said, God, please help me. I don't want to die like this. And I get down to that boarding house, and this is why I'm a believer in angels. 
There was a little blonde white woman standing there. And when I got to that door, it's as, it was as if everything stopped. And she looked me dead in my face and she said, Honey, you do not have to keep living like this. And I said, I'm sick. And I told her what happened and she went up to my room. She put a, a cold rag on my head and she began to tell me of her drinking. She didn't tell me how much she drank. She told me how she felt as a result of her drinking. As a result of the losses, how she felt. And she asked me if I'd go someplace with her. And I said, yeah, if it'll make me feel better, I'll go anywhere. And she took me to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And back then when I came into AA, it wasn't a lot of African-American people in AA. Well, kind of like it is here today. <laughs> Where are my brothers and my sisters at? Can I see your hands? God will love you. Hang in there. Hang on in there, brothers and sisters. You know, I'll tell you, when I came in and I, I didn't see any, any, any black people in AA. And I remember thinking, God, but we should feel special. You see what I'm saying? We should feel special like a, like a few little chocolate chips and a big old glass of milk. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Thank God that I learned that, that it didn't have anything to do with the color of my skin, that the only requirement for membership was a desire to stop drinking. That's what they told me. So we pull up to this clubhouse. I didn't know what that was at the time. It's about 50 Harleys parked out front. All these white people with white cups. And I said, well, it looks like it's going to be a pretty little interesting party. And I start walking up this walk with her. And people start reaching out their hands. They said, welcome. Welcome. Some guy was playing the guitar. Playing a John Denver song, you fill up my senses. Everybody seemed to be swaying to me, just. <laughs> and I said, well, this is all interesting. And I start to walk up the steps and this big biker dude grabs me, picks me up and goes, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Squirrel. <laughs> and I was like, uh, Squirrel, <laughs> you got to put me down, brother. And why they name your big buck squirrel? And I walk into this room and she says, some guy's going to tell his story. And she took me over and I sat to the right side of the room. The guy got up to the podium and he started talking. Oh, I was appalled. <laughs> Do you hear what I am saying? This man was, it was the strangest thing. Newcomer mentality. Because see, we forget sometimes how we viewed this when we came in. So this old white guy's up here, and he's going, yeah, I used to beat my wife every day. Then it seemed like the room went, ah! <laughs> and I said, whoa. <laughs> Just got me a new set of teeth. <laughs> and it seemed to me like everybody was like, bravo. <laughs> And I was like, these white people crazy up in here. <laughs> then something clicked, right? Did he say Alcoholics Anonymous? I said, oh, sister, you have hit an all-time low. You are in Alcoholics Anonymous. So this guy keeps on telling his story. Then they pass a basket. I said, well, here we go. It's church. And everybody's happily throwing, you know, to me, 20s and 50s and, you know, in. And I thought, what? And then here was the kicker. Everybody started. They rose up after he got done, and they roared, go! <laughs> then they went. I said, oh, my God, they're getting ready to pray. <laughs> Oh my God, they hypocrites too. I remember it was a black woman that was in AA when I got sober. She worked at the coffee bar. I remember when I saw her, I was so happy. I ran back to her. I was like, girl, these white people crazy. And she said, oh honey, you just keep coming back. I said, oh my God, they got you too. Run for your life, run. They, they start doing this chant. 
It was the weirdest thing. Keep coming back. It's was something, and I keep coming back, keep. <laughs> keep coming back, it's something if you're something. <laughs> keep coming back, it's something works if you're around. <laughs> and I kid you not, they were so happy, I thought they were saying, keep coming back. It squirts if you jerk it. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Kidding! <laughs> oh, I know some old timer gonna come up to me afterwards. I already know, but I'm ready for you. <laughs> I'm ready for you. AA for a little while. It wasn't like I had a huge social schedule or anything. And, you know, and I, I don't mean any, you know, any disrespect. I really, truly don't. I know I'm an alcoholic, but this is my story. You know, and I'm serious. You know, I got all the thousands of letters that the committee sent me, and you know, I, 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 I've not, I have not said one single cuss word. We got a lot of letters. I don't care what you guys say. And, uh, but about this time, they start coming into AA with this, you know, little crack problem. I know you guys don't have that issue down here. But in Ohio, it was crazy. I'm like, crack, what is that? No, 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 don't come in. Shh. Don't talk. Don't say anything. Maybe they'll come up with a crackaholics anonymous. But right now, you're in AA. And we deal with alcohol here. So I'm dogging them talking about it and I'm running around and I'm banging and I'm like, they don't belong here. They don't belong here. And one day, I'm sitting at a meeting and suddenly the thought crossed my mind. See, y'all have been talking about God using you as an instrument. I said, you know what? I think God using me as an instrument too. He want me to bring some black people into AA. And uh, I figured since I've been coming to AA all this time, that surely you would want to know if I was leaving. So I went through the 8.30 uh, p.m. meeting. They asked if it was any AA announcements. <laughs> I said, look here, people. I'm a rolling on about it here. Thank you for the real big blue book and everything. And, you know, I appreciate what you did. And I hope you know that alcohol will kill you. And then old timers, you know how sensitive they are. One going to stand up and go, well, get out of here then. There's people trying to stay sober in here. We'll see you if you make it back. I was like, oh, dang, Mr. Old Timer. I don't think I need to come back. Well, get out of here then. So I took my big book. I said, the first African-American person I see that look like they drunk, I'm going to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> so I walked down to the number 43 bus, climbed on that bus, sat there, two bus stops down. Bingo, there he was. <laughs> he got on the bus, y'all. I was so excited because I was going to help him get sober and stay sober one day at a time. And I slid over next to him on the bus. I said, look here, brother, you've been drinking? He said, yeah, I had a little something. something. I said, you know what? You could be alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> so he started cussing me out on the bus and everything. And I told him, I said, you know, the people from the AA club told me that you would probably react like this to my information. <laughs> so I'm going to give it to you the only way that I know how and the only way that you could probably receive it. And I told you I was from a family of Baptist ministers. And I took that big book and I opened it up to chapter 5. And I stood up in the aisle of that bus. <laughs> And I said, rarely, <laughs> did you hear what I said? I said, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. I said, those who do not recover are those who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. And the bus driver said, oh, hell no. <laughs> you got to get off this bus. So I told him he was an alcoholic too and, and I went on about my business and I went downtown where I knew it was some black alcoholics to the bar. And I walked in there with my big book with every resolve in me to help somebody today. And I went in that bar and they were dancing. Oh my God. But I knew they was in pain. <laughs> because I had been to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I knew that although they were dancing, they were hurting. So I pulled that plug out the jukebox. I said, black alcoholics. 
They got a place for you. It's called the Double A Club. You too can stop drinking and find a new way of life. And they say, well, what you doing down here? I said, oh, I graduated. I said, in step 17, say I'm supposed to help y'all. So they said, girl, if you don't plug that jukebox in, we'll kill you. I said, I understand your resentment, I do. But I must get my message across. And I climbed up on the bar and, and I opened up that book to chapter five. And I said, rarely! Did you hear what I said? I said, rarely have we seen a person fail who has fairly followed our, our, our path. I said, those who do not recover, those who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. And the bar owner goes, get out. You get out of here right now. And they lock me out the bar. And I read that book to the passerbyers. And suddenly the thought crossed my mind that one drink ain't going to help. I've been, I've been sober for a minute. One drink ain't going to kill me. Just one. If you're new in the room, that's the trick of the disease of alcoholism. It's to constantly tell us that we can have just one more. And that's what it told me. And I knocked on that door and I went back in that bar and I ordered a drink. I threw that drink back. And 45 minutes later, I was in a crack house. Well, that's for them. But this is what I found out, and I only share, with this, share you with this because this is what I've learned. Is that any time I stand in judgment of one of God's children, what I've done is just wrote myself a meal ticket to experience it on some level in my life. Thank God for the non-judgmentalism in AA. Thank God for the people who were working the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that when I came in and I said I was an addict, that they pulled me to the side and shared with me the singleness of purpose. Why I shouldn't say I'm an addict at an AA meeting. They didn't just fire on me because you know what? This is a program of attraction. If you'd have fired on me, I'd have left. Thank God those people shared that stuff with me and gave me a clear view of what it was going on here. So I come back, y'all, June the 20th, 1991. I weigh 85 pounds. My hair is matted to my head and I hadn't had a bath in three weeks. And I went to that clubhouse with all the shame and the guilt that we come back in with when we come back into AA. And I went back to that to the uh, coffee bar and that same old timer was there and he looked at me and he said, Andrew, you're going to die. And I said, I know. And I need you to help me. And he went, grabbed a book off the shelf and he said, you go out to that front door and you greet people. I was dirty, y'all. I had dirt under my fingernails. I hadn't brushed my teeth. I was nasty. And I went to that front door and I reached my hand out to people. And people walked past me. We got to be real careful that we don't get too good in here. That those people that may appear because of the way that they look, that they may not want recovery. The only requirement is a, member, is a desire to stop drinking. The only requirement. And if I would have left, you'd have a different speaker. So we got to be real careful with those nasty bums that come in that we think begging because they could be your next Florida State speaker. <laughs> so I come on back and I got me, some, you know, called my sponsor and Asked her if she'd sponsor me. She said, yeah. And we began working the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and she got me involved in institution meetings. She, I began to go to conferences. And that book that made no sense to me began to make sense. I'm like, Candace, I love Bill. Bill was whack. I love Bill. Absolutely love. And I come back. And when I came back, y'all, because of the level of my drinking, I couldn't even read when I came to AA, y'all. Thank God for the 530 Big Book meetings. When the people sat next to me, and as I stumbled over words, they would tell me what they meant. They would tell me how to pronounce it. My, my sponsor told me to stay in Big Book meetings. She said, they'll teach you how to read, Angie. One day I'm sitting at a meeting. One girl that I drank with that I knew was worse than me was sitting there talking about she wanted to go to college. And I remember thinking, I wonder if I could go to college. And then God said to me in that still small voice, not with that fake diploma you got. I had a diploma, but I made it in prison. <laughs> and it was in my personnel file. 
at my job. And I remember I went to my sponsor and I was like, I was wondering if there's any way I could go to college. I said, I got a diploma. I made it. And she goes, you made it? My sponsor was from England. She goes, what do you mean you made it? I said, I made it. She goes, what do you mean you made it? I said, I made it in prison. So it's not real? I was like, no. She goes, go get it. Go get it. I said, he's going to fire me. She goes, go do it anyway. And I went to my boss. And I told him, I said, that diploma in my personnel file is fake. He goes, what? <laughs> so he opens it up and he holds it up to the light. And he goes, you are good. <laughs> but he said, you got to have a high school education to work here. And I said, are you going to fire me? He said, no, I'll give you six months to get it. So I'm sitting in my very first apartment ever in my life watching TV, and all of a sudden, Sally Struthers came on. <laughs> and she said, you too can get your high school diploma on TV. I said, well, there we go right there. <laughs> so I send some money. They send me a science book. I take the test. They send me reading. I pass that. I send the test. I take all the tests. They send me my grade back. I go and I sign up for the equivalency of a diploma, and I got a perfect score. <laughs> May not be a lot to you, but it was a lot to me. And when that diploma came in the mail, December the 7th, 1999, I put it to my chest and I said, I'm going to college. And I ran up to the University of Cincinnati in admissions and I said, I want to, I want to go to college. <laughs> and they said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. And about this time, they incorporated the School of Addiction Studies. And I began to study addictions. And now I have my liberal arts and social sciences and addiction right. studies. I'm sorry, I gotta take my shoes off. I'm actually very short. So, so I'm in college and I'm doing this stuff, man. And I'm doing what y'all told me to do. Sit in the front. Sit in the front and ask questions. And that's what I did. I sat in the front. I got a whole stack of Kleenex here. I'm going to need another. Come on up here with that, uh, Garrett. I know I told you not to come back, but since when do you do what I tell you to do? And uh, so I get this whole thing. I'm going to school. I'm doing this. Life is changing for me. Stuff is happening. Those two kids. At three years sober, my parents asked me to step out of my kid's life because they were acting up. And they were acting out because I had showed back up. And man, that was the hardest decision. And I went to my sponsor and I said, they don't want me to see my kids no more. And my sponsor said, AMG, why don't you make a decision that's not based on sex? And I called my family back and I said, I'll stay away. But what that meant was I stayed away from my family. But I had to see my kids. If you're a parent, you know what I mean. And I would go to my daughter's soccer games, and I would have a hat and sunglasses on, and I would sit way over in the corner, but I would see her. And I would be in my son's baseball games. I had to see her. And the one thing that my sponsor told me, he said, Angie, you get your act together so that when they do return, and I believe that they will, you need to be a productive member of society. And on my daughter's 18th birthday, she called me. And she said, I want to see you. And I went, and I picked my baby up, and we went to the mall, and she spent all my money. <laughs> She spent every dime I had. And then I realized that I had to be a little more uh, specific in my prayers. That I'd like to see my daughter, but I most certainly would love to have a little change in my pocket afterwards. And, uh, but we went to that mall, and I had to get her back. And in that car, she just put her head on my shoulder. See, this is the amazing thing. That when my daughter sat in that car with her head on my shoulder, it was like we'd never been separated. And she said, Angie, you okay? I said, I'm okay. She said, you don't drink no more. I said, no, I don't. 
She said, I don't want to cause no problems with my family and you. I said, I know. I said, I know. And she said, so if you don't hear from me, it's because I just don't want to rock the boat. I said, I understand. But I was able to clean off my side of the street with my daughter. My daughter attends college in Gramley State, Louisiana. And she calls me on a regular basis. She was there when Katrina hit it. She was so scared. We hadn't heard from her for six days, and we were so scared. And when she called, she said, they're bringing all the other kids to the school, to this college, and I don't know what to do. She said, please say that prayer that you say with me when I call. And I said, I will, Whitney. And the prayer goes like this. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou will. Relieve me of the bondage of self so that I may better do thy will and take away my difficulties. That victory over them may bear witness to those that I would help with thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. See, you gave that to me, and I was able to pass that on to my daughter as a means of strength for her also. She's doing well. She graduates next year, and I'll be speaking in her town that weekend. And that Sunday, I get to get up and go to my daughter's graduation. The gifts of Alcoholics Anonymous said, God, oh yeah, and she's dating a white guy. <laughs> oh, God help me. I don't care who you are. You hear some news like that, you got a little something to say about it. <laughs> He's a good guy. His name's Jeremy. I, I think that's the whitest name you could have. <laughs> His name's Jeremy. When my son would see him, he'd be like, hey, Jeremy, where's Josh and Jake? <laughs> He's a good guy, though. He loves my daughter, and that's all that matters. And he treats her like the queen she should be treated like. My son is in prison for quite some time. Thank God for the people that take AA meetings in the prisons where my son goes to meetings. Man, I wanted to go get him. Thank God for the program of al where I wanted to go get my baby out of jail so bad. And my sponsor said, why would you go get him? Did anybody come and get you? Let him go on his journey. Love him enough to let him go on this journey, and that's what I did. So I don't know, y'all, about three years ago I got a phone call, and somebody said, we just heard your tape, and we were wondering if you would speak at the International Convention of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thought it was my friend Tony playing games on my phone. <laughs> so when he said it, I was like, Tony, quit playing games on my phone. You are so stupid. <laughs> And he goes, ma'am, this is so-and-so from World Services. So I said, I better go up and check the caller ID in the other room. And I went and it said New York. So I was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Can I help you? <laughs> and uh, I wasn't even going to the uh, international because they were saying they weren't letting felons over in, uh, you know, Canada. And so I said, well, they're, you know. My sponsor said, you act as if. Then that guy from World Services said, I want you to call this guy at the Canadian consulate, who will then have you call this guy, who will then have call you call this guy. And then I had to go and get a, um, a um, transcript of all of my old criminal charges. And I must say to you that that was devastating to me because when I looked at some of the charges, I didn't even remember being there. It actually said that I got a lot of money. I don't remember that. <laughs> and I was mad because I don't remember that money. <laughs> So I sent that in and I just knew that they weren't going to let me into Canada. And the day that I was leaving for the international, I packed up the night before and the day that I was leaving, I got a letter that said, welcome to Canada. And I went over there and I spoke Friday night and it was a life-changing experience for me. Life-changing experience for me. And from that point on, I've been able to go in places that I only saw in magazines. There's somebody like me that's homeless drunk could travel, could look out my window and see that water out there. Some people live here, you guys are used to it, but for a homeless drunk like me, it's magical. Catherine and I were out there and we were just looking out there and I just said, who would have thought that I'd be somewhere like this? I don't know, y'all, life is good. Life is good. 
Life happens. And even in the midst of life happening, life is good. Because what you told me was I'd be able to stay sober through any storm that comes my way. In the book it says that we will rise above it. Because there's one who has all power. That one is God. I'm happy to be here. I'm going to close with this. Back home, my granny used to hum this song. And I never ever knew the meaning of it until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous and I heard it one day at the closing of a convention. And I'm going to close with this. Amazing grace how sweet the the sound that saved a red like me see I was was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I, I see. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.